This video is sponsored by me and you. Find out more at the end. An ex-Muslim willingly walks into a mosque. This is not the beginning of a bad joke, but what I actually did a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to see how it would feel to pray Aisha and Taraweeh in jama'ah, as in, in a group at the mosque. It had been years since I stepped into one of those buildings because I no longer believe in Islam. Consequently, I no longer feel obligated or even inclined to pray by myself, let alone around others. So how did it go? What was going through my head as I, an atheist, partook in this religious group activity? How did it affect my non-belief? And am I now more likely to rejoin Islam? Watch this video to find out and give it a thumbs up. I tell you what, if this video reaches 10,000 likes somehow, I'll go to Mecca and I'll even do Umrah. And that's the Aladdin guarantee. The idea to go to the mosque came to me a few weeks ago during Ramadan. I remember the hadith about the shaitan being locked up during this month. And of course, I remember how often ex-believers are accused of confusing the devil's whispers with critical thinking. Though I don't believe in the devil, I decided to humor it. So I thought, what better time to walk into a house of Allah without the whispers of the devil than during Ramadan? Keep in mind that I didn't do this as a challenge. My trip to the mosque and how it went says nothing about the validity or invalidity of the religion. I just wanted to experience it for myself and see what comes out of it. And I didn't want to half-ass it either, so I went to lengths to ensure that I was in the best headspace for it and that I did everything by the book, so to speak. Not literally by the book, because there's nothing in the holy book about how to pray, or even that you're supposed to pray five times a day. None of that is in the Qur'an, but that's besides the point. I started by doing wudu at home, which is the cleansing ritual you must do before prayer. Or even if you fart mid prayer, you gotta cleanse and start over. I didn't think that wudu would make me any cleaner than the shower I had already taken, but like I said, I wanted to do everything properly. And on my way to the mosque, I decided not to listen to music. Not because it's haram, but because I didn't want anything to affect my mood or experience of the prayer to come. So I sat in silence, and I checked in with myself to determine how I felt. I had a great day, and I accomplished a lot, so I felt calm at the time. And I didn't feel nervous about going to the mosque either, except for a little concern about whether I could possibly be recognized as Aladdin. But I trusted that this disguise works, and that people probably aren't paying much attention to each other during prayer anyway. I wrote down my thoughts and feelings to clear my head, and I noticed that the closer I got to the mosque, the more excited I felt. It had been so long that this became a novel experience once again. I didn't have any expectations going into it, but I knew that it would probably be interesting. Outside the mosque, I silenced my phone and I put away my watch because I didn't want it to affect my perception of time during prayer. And when I walked in, I anticipated that musty smell of socks that some mosques have, but thankfully this one smelled fine. And as I looked around, I realized that I didn't recognize anyone, which was a good thing. I wanted to tune out everyone else's presence as much as I could and focus on my personal experience. I intended on being there early enough to sit down and read some Quran before prayer, but I ended up losing track of time while solving a puzzle. I don't have ADHD. I have 84K. But I got there early enough to pray the two rakahs of Sunnah before Aisha. Soon after I was done, it was time to pray Aisha. The imam called for everyone to line up in rows and get tightly packed, shoulder to shoulder, foot to foot. And I've always cringed at this part because I like my personal space and I'm not into playing footsies with guys. But I understand that when space is at a premium, standing in a tight formation helps fit more worshippers into a mosque. And I do wonder if it feels to some people like a big group hug or an alternative to showing friendly intimacy towards other men. No homo. And so the prayer commenced. I followed along, saying all the things I'm supposed to say quietly and out loud. I even read the verses with the imam if I had them memorized. And soon enough, I found myself easily getting into the flow of prayer without consciously thinking about it, like it was second nature. A believer might interpret that as a sign of Allah facilitating my prayer and my eventual return to Islam, but more realistically, it's just muscle memory. When you do something regularly for a decade or two of your formative years, it tends to stick with you for better or for worse. Now that my involvement with the physical aspects of prayer felt pretty passive, I found my attention wandering around the mosque. First to the carpet, then to the people around me, then the ceiling. And one thing I couldn't help but notice was how differently everyone prayed. Where they put their hands, how quickly or slowly they moved, how silently or loudly they vocalized, it all varied from person to person. I had to remind myself that I'd look odd if I had my head up while everyone else had theirs bowed down, as symbolic as that image may look, I wanted to blend in, so I looked down again to minimize visual distractions. I wasn't sure whether to allow my thoughts to wander or to try my best to focus on the words. Luckily, I had many rakahs to experiment with, so I tried a few different approaches. For the entirety of Isha, I focused intently on the words of the Qur'an. 
And funny enough, many of the verses the Imam happened to recite were the same ones I made videos about, so they were pretty fresh in my memory. Other times, I treated the prayer like a meditation session. I focused on my breath or on one of my senses. I even closed my eyes to isolate myself further from my surroundings. And I felt my thoughts and worries melting away as I did the movements and said the words. That was until any of the verses caught my attention and interrupted my meditation. I noticed that the way the Imam recited Qur'an factored into my experience. By that I mean which verses he began and ended with, how he enunciated or sang the words, and how he dramatized some of them. I'm guessing that if one doesn't understand Arabic, they might have a wonderful time listening to a sheikh deliver a performance akin to a vocalist or an opera singer. Similar to how people vibe to Latin music without realizing that the lyrics are kind of weird. Maybe that's why Muhammad wasn't too fond of music, because he noticed that it evokes an emotional response similar to the Qur'an. Some of the verses the Imam recited were about stories, like the story of Musa and Al-Khidr. Those I can find somewhat engaging, even if the moral of the story is dubious. But most of the verses were a variation or a combination of the following. A promise of the Day of Judgment, a promise of torture, a promise of reward, a warning, a threat, an affirmation of Muhammad's truthfulness, an unsubstantiated claim, a praise in the form of a trait Allah possesses, those are the bad people, those are the good people, and so on. It gets pretty repetitive pretty quickly. Eventually, after enough rak'ahs of taraweeh, my methods of meditating and attempting to get enjoyment out of the prayer started to lose their efficacy. Definitely no tahajjud for me. I was getting restless and stiff, like I needed a proper stretch and an exercise, and I was starting to feel a bit of a heightened annoyance towards interruptions, like people who were sniffing too loud or letting their phones ring. I took that as my cue to end the prayer and note down my thoughts at home, and since I had no obligation to stay, I left when I felt like it. So how did this compare to my prayers back when I was a Muslim? The biggest difference I noticed was that praying as an apostate, I finally felt safe. Ironic, I know. Let me explain. From a very young age, I often felt a heavy blanket of gloominess in Islamic settings. For example, at a Qur'an lesson, or in Mecca, or at a mosque. And it's not because the worshippers were hostile, and it's not like I was incapable of feeling a happy emotion at the mosque. But anything positive I felt was dulled down and coated with a dense layer of doom and gloom. When seemingly every other verse is laced with threats and far-fetched claims about a metaphysical reality that I can't seem to make sense of, it can be difficult to think of anything but the direness of our existence. My concerns fluctuated between worrying about my own fate and worrying about the fate of humanity at large. If Allah truly exists and everything the Qur'an claims is real, then why should I or anyone else care about anything aside from prayer and worship? How was I supposed to switch from a slave groveling for Allah's preemptive forgiveness to a regular human concerned with school and work and friends and other menial worldly matters? How could I appreciate or love Allah when prayer reminded me of the torch he holds to my head multiple times a day? And it's not like the dangling of heavenly rewards in front of me did much to neutralize the Qur'an's fear tactics. How could I care about frolicking in heavenly gardens, or having little servant boys, or getting laid, when eternal skin-melting torture was also a possibility? And when I wasn't thinking about myself, or if I felt safe enough from hell, I was thinking about all the people who are going to be eternally tortured. Even as a Muslim, I couldn't make sense of how not believing in one of the many unprovable religions makes a person worthy of eternal punishment. And if you believe the hadiths, the majority of humanity is destined for hell. Nobody around me felt too troubled by that fact, but I was. They were fine going in and out of the mosque, maybe even reassured and relaxed when they prayed, but it seemed like empathy was my Achilles heel, preventing me from fully enjoying praying. Hearing the threats and warnings in the Qur'an was analogous to having foreknowledge of a colossal nuclear apocalypse that will kill billions of people, and we're supposed to praise the entity firing the nukes for sparing us specifically. It was a confusing and saddening affair that I hated to be reminded of. Even during periods of my life when I believed that I was doing a good enough job as a slave of Allah, I didn't feel safe in his presence. And by his presence, I mean the presence of his reminders. Being potentially spared from his vindictive wrath if I beg him enough, it doesn't change his terrifying image. It's like having a parent who threatens you every day. Even if they spare you and viciously attack your siblings, you wouldn't view them as merciful and lovable, but as a danger that you temporarily evaded. Compare all that to how I felt during this visit to the mosque, I was more at peace than I had ever been as a Muslim. Ever. All the doom and gloom in the Qur'an couldn't worry me for a fleeting moment. I was immune to the boogeyman factor, so to speak, and I felt so powerful. And I know that this might disturb some believers, interpreting my words as arrogance against Allah, 
But I didn't feel powerful because I thought I could win against an infinitely capable god. I felt powerful because I overcame man-made dogma hiding behind the facade of an unquestionable god. Towards the end of my journey with faith, I subconsciously avoided prayer because it trapped me in a mental room with my cognitive dissonance. In a sense, I knew that if I faced my critical thoughts, I was unlikely to keep up the illusion of having faith. I was unsure of myself, blaming both myself and the devil for my skepticism, and I felt ashamed simultaneously for not being Muslim enough and for not being intellectually honest enough. This time, I felt neither uncertainty nor shame, but instead reassurance and pride. Though I do not know how or if life began and whether there's an overarching narrative that explains our existence, I know that the answers Islam offers are not true. Consequently, all the threats in the Qur'an fell flat. During prayer, I did not feel an iota of hesitation or fear. I still felt empathy, not for the inhabitants of hell, because they don't exist, but for the real tortured souls on earth who live in fear because of religion. And I don't just mean those in the process of deconstructing their faith, but also those who never leave it. I don't think a Muslim or a Christian or a doomsday cultist deserves to suffer the psychological torment of their beliefs just because they're wrong, or because they seemingly chose their religion. In my opinion, we don't have as much choice over our beliefs as we like to think, so it doesn't hurt to put ourselves in other people's shoes and figure out ways to help them out rather than berating them for their predicaments. Another point of comparison is how I reacted to distraction from prayer. Back when I was a Muslim, I felt guilty for losing my focus, which tended to happen a lot, not just during prayer, but I wasn't as compassionate with myself as I should have been. I believed what I was told, that the devil whispers in my ear to distract me from prayer, or in a more explicit version of that narrative, shaitan might urinate in my ear to prevent me from hearing the call to prayer in the first place. This is from the same hadith corpus by which the Qur'an is interpreted, and it's the foundation on which the majority of the religion of Islam is built, but that's a story for another time. Now when I get distracted during meditation, I don't attribute it to a moral deficiency or permeability to the devil, I just gently nudge myself back on track. And while I still felt stiff and restless after a long prayer, now I listen to my body. I left and I stretched when I felt like it, instead of masochistically trying to enjoy the discomfort because it translates to more brownie points with Allah. The purpose of my visit to the mosque was entirely different from my believer days. I wasn't there out of obligation or duty, but voluntarily. I wasn't pleading for mercy or confronting my cognitive dissonance under duress. I was there to satisfy my curiosity, to see how I feel about prayer now, and to better understand the experience of a Muslim or a closeted ex-Muslim in my city and to figure out ways to make this ritual better serve those who are forced to do it. So how did this compare to my experience as a closeted ex-believer? The last time I was at the mosque, I didn't go there voluntarily. I was still coming to terms with leaving religion, and I happened to be invited to iftar by a friend of my parents. He presumed I was still a Muslim, as most Arabs are, so he took me to the mosque for Isha and Taraweeh. I didn't object, because I didn't yet know how to do that and I didn't want to hastily choose that moment to come out to a man I barely knew, and by extension to the rest of my family. So I went, begrudgingly, and I pretended to pray. I felt disappointed in myself for not being open about my apostasy, even though I did what was in my best interest at the time. I didn't enjoy the prayer one bit because all I could think about was how much I didn't want to be there. That made the boredom and restlessness much less manageable. I left when the guy did because he was my ride, and I promised myself to never be in that situation again. It took me years of gradual deconstruction and confrontation to feel comfortable telling Muslims in my life that I no longer practice or believe, and I understand that not everyone is privileged enough to be so open without societal or familial retaliation, so I hope this doesn't come across as an endorsement of prayer and its benefits. I was able to enjoy it because I chose to do it, and I did it on my own terms, in my own way. If you're pressured or forced to pray, you may feel a loss of agency, like you have no control over your body or your time. But I urge you to take back ownership. Recognize that you can exercise some control over your mind. While you passively do the movements of prayer, treat it like a chance to take a break from your day. You can meditate, you can repeat positive affirmations, or make up poetry, or imagine yourself in a happier place. Your thoughts are yours and yours alone. Never forget that. I managed to take the Islam out of the Salah, and you can do it too. If the movement of prayer gives your lizard brain some sort of relief, then do it. It's not an admission that Islam is true or that God works in mysterious ways. You're just taking advantage of a habit you grew up developing. Might as well, since it might take up space in your brain whether you want it to or not. So what else did this visit to the mosque teach me? 
I recognize the efficacy of ritual and conditioning, and so do religious leaders. They say that praying regularly strengthens your faith and your connection to God, and I only half agree. Doing a ritual religiously, pun intended, keeps you in the faith, not because of metaphysical reasons, but because humans are very sociable and impressionable. It's much harder to diverge from a crowd when you're regularly partaking in group activities with that crowd. It feels as if you are part of something much bigger than yourself, something you should never be so bold to challenge. You might even think to yourself, how could I be right and all those people at the mosque are wrong? But it's no different from following the flow of a crowd during an emergency. You may not know where the danger is, but seeing a crowd running in one direction, you'll assume that they have it figured out and you run away with them. Religious narratives can keep you in a perpetual state of emergency, fleeing away from hellfire and running towards mercy. More about conditioning. Consider how a worshipper is supposed to bow their head during prayer and never look up, because that would be disrespectful and defiant in Allah's presence. This humility in body language can translate to feeling too small and insignificant to dare and question Allah's religion, when in reality it's a man-made idea that is being shielded from scrutiny, not a god. There's also the sunk cost predicament. When you invest so much of your time and your life in prayer, and you form a lot of your friendships and relationships in a religious community, it's incredibly difficult to risk losing all that you've invested by questioning your beliefs. So even if a believer doesn't understand the words they say or hear during prayer, it can still serve as a group retention mechanism. That being said, I realize that believers' experiences of prayer can vary wildly. Different mosques have different imams, reading different verses with different styles of delivery. Even within the same mosque, worshippers might be reacting to the verses differently. Most may not understand them at all because of the language barrier, while others might selectively focus on different parts of the recitation. What initially seems like a united front of worshippers is actually a constellation of different degrees and connotations of belief. When I first left Islam, it was outrageous and shocking to me that people aren't all in the same headspace I'm in. That even if I tell them about the verses and hadiths that got me to where I am, they may not digest them the same way. I realize now that the way two believers experience and interpret a religion varies wildly, even within the same row of the same mosque. I have to admit that over the years I grew bored and wary of pointing out flaws in Islam, and believe me there are plenty. I just know enough that I no longer need to find them to reassure myself that Islam isn't true. And I still intend on making videos every now and then pointing out said flaws, but I recognize that critique of the scripture isn't the only component of a successful deconstruction. Listing all the flaws in the Quran will not change every believer's mind, nor would it extensively help ex-Muslims who already don't believe. So I find myself gravitating towards the human experience side of things. If you're insulated enough from Muslims, the bulk of your exposure to them might come from the most obnoxious examples online, or through critique of the religion, which might skew your assessment of reality. I know that going to a mosque and keeping to myself doesn't really teach me all that much about Muslims in my city, but it's a reminder that most of them don't go to mosques to discuss world domination or the latest in Dawah apologetics. They're mostly trying to do what they think is mandatory or encouraged for their salvation. So it was a grounding experience to be around that many Muslims again. That being said, I recognize that I felt safe among them because I wear a mask. I'm well aware of the hostility that a lot of believers direct at dissenting voices, my anonymity doesn't just protect my safety, though. It also allows me to do the work I do without being hindered by my undeserved status as a public enemy. Despite the hostility I might face from Muslims, I don't view Islam as a problem to be dealt with only from the outside, or a target to be exterminated. I know that a lot of people are content with their faith, and as long as they don't harm themselves or others with it, their faith does not concern me. But I work diligently to help those who are affected negatively by the religion, most of whom are Muslims and ex-Muslims, by the way. Not to deny that non-Muslims at times also suffer because of Islam, but I abhor the narrative that Islam is a purely evil ideology, or that to believe it you'd have to be foolish or malicious. People generally have good intentions, but their upbringing, environment, and beliefs about the metaphysical and their fear of eternity might push them to the wrong methods or conclusions. So, in conclusion, I found my trip to the mosque to be way more enjoyable and profound than how it used to feel. Among other things, this experience reminded me of how far I've come in my deconstruction journey. I can now approach the topic with much less discomfort and emotional entanglement, and without fear or undeserved reverence. If you're an ex-believer who hasn't been to a mosque or a place of worship in a while, consider trying it out once. It can't hurt you, and it will likely reassure you. My questions for you are... How does understanding or not understanding the words affect your experience of Salah? 
Is it easier to tune it out when you don't get it, or does that make it more difficult to sit through? And where did our experiences converge, and where did they align? Let me know in the comments below. Though I didn't spend a lot of time on research for this video, it still took me a considerable amount of time and effort to prepare and present my thoughts in a clear and concise way. And I wouldn't be able to do that without your continued support. So thank you to all of you who enable me to do what I do. If you believe in my mission and would like to help me displace some of the more hateful discourse in this space, leave a like and a comment and consider supporting me monetarily. You could become a patron or YouTube member and join our Discord community. And if you'd like to chat with me, keep an eye out for call-in live streams on Wednesdays or find the link in the description to book a one-on-one -on -one session. Once again, thank you all for your support. We're building up a sizable and productive community and I could not do this without you. And as always, think critically and think for yourself.